I want to introduce to you Kate Lundquist, who uh, co-directs the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center's Water Institute and the Bring Back the Beaver campaign, which is based in Sonoma County, California. Kate collaborates with landowners, communities, tribes, conservation organizations, and resource agencies to uncover obstacles, identify strategic solutions, and implement beaver and process-based restoration treatments to conserve watersheds, recover listed species, increase water security, and build resilience to climate change. Wonderful. Well, I'm so excited. So many of you have shown up today for this presentation at lunch, and I see some familiar names and faces, so let's get to it. So as was already said, I work with the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. We're a nonprofit that's been around since 1994. We work around the state and actually around the world, uh, really supporting folks in becoming more resilient and doing collaborative conservation from ridge line to reef. And I co-direct the Water Institute with my co-director, Brock Dolman. He couldn't be with us today. Some of you know him. And we've been working with a lot of different stakeholders around the state to really figure out what are some innovative solutions for helping restore our watersheds. Many agencies, tribes, NGOs, and landowners of all sorts of different stripes. So excited to get to share some insights of what we've been learning over the last couple of decades. So for the last decade in particular, we've been really focusing on the role beaver could play in conservation and watershed restoration. And so we actually launched a Bring Back the Beaver campaign. <laughs> Why is that even necessary? Well, it turns out that California in particular has had an unusual relationship to beaver and has a little bit of a blind spot with regards to the benefits of beaver. And when I talk about beaver, we're talking about the North American beaver, Castor canadensis. And so we, to address these issues that were coming up in the state, we started this campaign to really identify and resolve historic social and informational barriers and to support folks in coexisting and actively collaborating with beaver using techniques such as process-based restoration and other design criteria and then creating pathways to return beaver to their former range and ultimately looking at state regulations to see if any need to be changed or uh, if guidance needs to be implemented. So that's what we've been working on. And we have, hold on one sec here, my advanced mode is just, there we go. So one of the first informational barriers we ran into early on was, are beaver even native to California and if so, where? This is an ongoing discussion. However, in 2012, our colleagues published some historic evidence in the form of buried beaver dams uh, that prove that beaver were in fact native in the Sierra Nevada. So back in 1942, there was a report that was put out by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife that estimated that the historic range was only in the Klamath, Modoc area, the Central Valley, and the Colorado River, and nowhere else were beaver native to. This has since been proven to be incorrect. We have found a bunch of evidence, physical evidence in the form of buried beaver dams, beaver bones, also a lot of historic accounts, and tons of ethnographic evidence across the state, indicating that the range is actually far greater than we previously thought. And it's to really important to know this because this has affected how beaver have been managed. Often they are managed as a non-native nuisance and therefore not necessarily uh, kept around or allowed to persist. And we used to have over 400 million beaver across North America pre-contact and therefore was used basically to create hats and they're funded the whole colonization of North America. And so by the time California was formed as a state, most of the beaver had already been trapped out. The fur rush came long before the gold rush. And so the records that people, or the the amount of beaver that people were looking at when they were trying to figure out where they were needed to were, were far, far, far diminished. And this has had a huge impact on our watersheds since we do not have anywhere near the beaver that we once stayed in California. Thankfully, our Department of Fish and Wildlife followed 
the example of many other agencies in the arid west uh, idaho got really smart early on and in their remote locations started moving beaver not only by vehicle and horseback but also tossing them out of airplanes and california followed suit in 1950 as well and if you haven't this is not a comic that we created this actually the flyer on the right here was created by the california department of fish and wildlife and if you haven't seen the videos that are online, highly recommend you check them out. There is old black and white footage of this uh, effort of putting beers in, in boxes that opened on impact. And so that is a part of our colorful history of, of re, uh, rewilding beaver in mm -hmm. our arid Western states. And so it helps to know what beavers life history strategies are and why they are doing what they're doing to better understand how we can leverage their efforts and, and use them towards uh, meeting our own mandates of trying to conserve and, and re replenish our, our watersheds. So beaver are a semi-aquatic mammal and they spend most of their time in the water foraging. And this is where the question that I had put in as a fossil, I put it in the chat, but we should talk about whether or not beavers are herbivores or not, this would be a good time for y'all to guess. I saw some in the chat already, but take a guess and, and don't be shy. Uh, the state of Oregon, which is the beaver state, uh, often does not know this answer as well. 50% of their population polled got it wrong. So no, 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 uh, no wrong choice. Just uh, fill it out and we'll see what, uh, what we get here. Yeah, everybody is responding to the question, so that's great. Great. Well, while you're responding to that, I'm going to talk about what they're doing in these aquatic habitats. Uh, so mm -hmm. they are trying to protect themselves from predation. So they are a very large rodent. They can get up to 80 pounds. The, the record is 120 pounds. So that's a lot of meat. Uh, for predators to try to get after. And they are very highly sought after by mountain lions and wolves and bear and coyote. Bobcats will even take them down. And so for them having at least three feet of water depth for them to travel around in and also so that they can have a burrow that has a submerged entrance so that predators cannot get in and eat their young because they actually live. Wow, I'm just going to stop and look at the poll results very close awesome well <laughs> hey great to you they are in fact herbivores and it's very common that people think they eat fish and that they're bad for fish but they are not they are actually creating fantastic habitat for fish and so because they're trying to create and maintain all of this body mass they need to eat a lot of the vegetation predominantly bark roots leaves grasses they eat seasonally, depending on what's happening in, you know, the particular environment that they find themselves in. And they do exist everywhere from the taiga all the way down to the Sonoran Desert. And so what limits their uh, extent is wood and water, food and water, basically. And they do like to have wood accessible as well for chewing on to keep their teeth sharp and also to uh, build wool if they need to build. And so we have two different scenarios. We either have beaver showing up in an existing water body, a pond, a lake. And in that case, all they need is to just build a lodge out from the shore so it's protected, ideally. And then they start digging canals. And these canals can be up to four feet deep. If you've ever fallen in one like I have, you can attest to how significant they are. And these canals basically lead to their favorite food sources and building sources. In this case, this is the lake in South Lake Tahoe, South Lake Bonnelly Lake, and then Glen Alpine Watershed. And these are all aspen trees, which they love to eat aspen leaves and bark. And if they find themselves in a moving body of water, they will, if they can, and if the water's not deep enough, they will build a dam. And in that case, that's going to back the water up, slow it down, spread it out onto that floodplain, but also provide them deep enough water that they can have an underground or underwater entrance to their bank burrow, as you can see in this lower left uh, image here. And they don't always build dams in rivers. If it's a big river, like Sacramento River, no, that's too big. They don't need to build a dam. And they're very calorically efficient, so they're not going to build a dam if they don't need to. And dams across big rivers like that are too hard to build and don't persist. And so you're more likely to see it these dams be built seasonally in flashy rivers that get low in the summer or 
perennially in, in rivers that have a lower base flow. So moving right along, beavers are what are considered to be a keystone species. And so in doing all of these habitat modifications that they do to protect themselves, they actually provide a disproportionate uh, amount of ecosystem services to all kinds of other species. And in particular in California, a lot of our listed species benefit from beaver habitat. Cobo salmon in particular, our sage hen, Cascades frogs, Western pond turtle, and Sierra Nevada willow flycatcher have all shown really benefit from the presence of beaver in their ecosystems. And you can see in this slide up here, this was a meadow with a single threaded channel and the beaver came in and started damming and expanding the extent of the wetted area. And now this is a huge, massive wetland. And so with that, getting more into the details of the benefits that they provide, when beaver are damming up the systems that they are in, they create, the, create these wetland complexes. And those complexes end up helping buffer a lot of the climate extremes that we are experiencing these days. In particular, floods, they can help mitigate the, the energy of floodwaters. So imagine lots of multiple speed bumps and beaver dams, and especially the beaver have already connected a mode channel to the floodplains themselves, which they often do, as you can see in this image here. Uh, lots of flood plank connectivity. This is going to help dissipate the energy of burst flood waters and, and make them less um, damaging. And also, you know, if one dam blo blows out, the several d subsequent dams that Beaver build will help catch that energy as well. And then some recent re uh, research that has come out, thanks to Dr. Emily Fairfax, who is at Cal State University Channel Islands, uh, the Smoky Beaver study is, is the coming quite popular right now because what it has shown that these these oases that beaver create, especially in our large landscape scales, often on public lands, um, they don't burn in wildfire. And so they create these incredible buffers and they also become these refugia for a bunch of species that are caught in that wildfire. And Emily Fairfax has some footage of bear that have survived fire that are still in the beaver wetland. And this can be helpful for um, for an arid west that is burning more and more frequently and more intensely. And these dams also end up acting as sediment traps and so improve not only water quantity, but they can help improve water quality. So they trap nutrients and in so doing, these dams can often back up soils. And this is how a lot of our Montean meadows were originally created for three beaver dams, and there is evidence through ground penetrating radar or done in the Rockies, where a lot of their large alpine meadows have buried beaver dams underneath them. And this is a photo of South Lake Tahoe, the Taylor Creek uh, river mouth or creek mouth that comes out at South Lake Tahoe at Baldwin Beach. And a study was done there by Sarah Muskov that indicates that those dams are actually holding the phosphorus uh, back from entering the lake and thus improving the water quality itself. And so we like to say that uh, it's actually beavers that keep Tahoe blue. And we want to keep them there and make sure that they get to continue doing that great work. And so these dams also help function in our Mediterranean environment in recharging our groundwater and delaying the release into the privacy zone. And so just like we really want to maintain our upland meadows intact because they act as sponges, having beaver at any place appropriate in the watershed from the ridgeline down to the reef where they can be building these dams and maintaining them, especially into the dry summer and fall season, is going to help increase the amount of water we have stored and available. And especially as they're shutting it out onto the floodplain and just increasing that overall saturation. And there's some interesting research that's happening right now. Again, Dr. Emily Fairfax is working on a study in Colorado to uh, help try to quantify the actual numbers of, of what, how much volume can be expected from deeper recharge, you know, different complexes and number of dams and whatnot. And whether we have those numbers or not, all you have to do is go into the field. And a lot of the folks that we work with, scientists, 
we're doing studies in meadows and um, different foothill restoration sites. They have a lot of groundwater wells that are definitely showing the difference of before beaver, after beaver, and just the amount of groundwater that is actually being stored by these mothbuds is, is significant. And this is uh, actually a creek, Susie Creek in Nevada, and the um, Elko District of the Bureau of Land Management was really trying to restore this creek because it has endangered Wuhan cutthroat trout in it. And this was owned by some ranchers who were grazing year round, and the creek had become deeply incised. It was very disconnected from floodplain, not storing water, and devoid of vegetation. And the cattle were not actually, other than the water they were getting from it, they weren't getting a lot of productivity or forage out of it. And so they came up with the idea of asking the ranchers to pull the cattle off on the hot season and see if they can help it recover. And sure enough, just by doing that, the vegetation was immediately able to recover. And now this was enough vegetation that beaver were able to show up on their own. And once they showed up at this stage, they started doing their work and impounding and expanding the wetland. And it started looking like this. And these are ranchers who basically were willing to go on record saying, yeah, 20 years ago, our management practice was to shoot the beaver. And now we acknowledge we wouldn't have a beaver. We wouldn't have an operation if it weren't for the beaver. So amazing to see that kind of change happening in terms of management practices amongst different land users. So our theme is we really got to fight incision with incisors and, and really fight into this and make sure that we get some of this amazing work done and recognized out there. And it's not just the dams that are helping provide all of these ecological benefits. This is a fantastic study that was done on, on the Smith River, which is far northern California, and really just trying to look at in large systems in this case, the Smith, where beaver do not put in channels forming dams, they were looking at what happens with their burrows. And it turns out they found these stick piles out in front of the burrows themselves were providing significant habitat for a bunch of different native species. And not only that, it was the burrows themselves. They put cameras in there and they found Look who they found, all kinds of different boats. We have different endangered frogs and fish from coho and native suckers and all kinds of different aquatic species really benefit. And so now they're starting to look at the burrows and then they stick quarrels as and basically functioning as river reefs and providing habitat cover and oil. A place for these native species to avoid being preyed upon and also avoid getting washed out during whole flows, which is really important, especially for our fellow. So it's goes without saying, beaver clearly have a lot of talents and we want to really harness those and honor them for those. And thankfully, our state agencies are really starting to recognize the value of beaver and as a nature based solution. And Last year, uh, after years of working with different partners and stakeholders, we pulled together some folks to uh, write a letter to our California Natural Resources Agency asking that beaver and process-based restoration be included as a major base solution in the California Natural Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy. And we were successful in doing a lot, which has been fantastic. And now, fast forward to the May announcement of the governor's budget a moment, and in there was a certain funds to uh, create a new beaver restoration program that will be run by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And this was approved by the legislature. Super fantastic. And so this Today, actually, they just closed the final position that they're trying to hire. They're hiring five permanent staff, uh, which is fantastic. So those staff, their job are, is going to be to basically review all the codes that are pertaining to beaver, making sure that the kind of restoration work that we want to do, which will now include relocation, that that can all be done within existing code, and then working on creating a beaver large model, which... California does not have. We did a status of beaver report in 1942 that I already referred to, but nothing has been done since then. 
And so this is fantastic. We have lots of other states that have robust fear management plans where we are hoping to support the department in following suit and creating a rigorous science-based plan that really supports good beaver restoration practices. And one of those is really to mitigate conflict because in 2019, the uh, California Wildlife Protection Act was passed and that made it no longer legal to recreationally trap uh, fur bears. And so that was taken off the table for beaver. However, still we have hundreds, sometimes thousands of beaver in a year in California that are terminated because of conflict with landowners. And so we really want to support everyone in figuring out how to coexist. And we've been working with the department in that regard. And they are currently with our inputs have come up with a draft guidance document with how to go about coexisting with beaver and what we can do to better all live with them so that we can keep them on the landscape longer and benefit from their, their habitat improvements. And ultimately, as I said, there's a lot of different types of beaver restoration projects that the department wants to support, including relocation, which up until this point, the department had not been doing and certainly currently cannot allow others to relocate beaver, but has the ability to do it themselves. And now they're committing to doing that on, on now starting this coming year, which is fantastic. And you can see from the quote here from Governor Newsom that he too is obviously recognizing the value of beaver, which we really appreciate um, to be successful in our efforts to protect biodiversity department. Let's take a proactive leap towards bringing beavers back onto the landscape for a concerted effort to combine prioritized restoration projects, partnerships, local, federal, and state agencies and tribes, and updated policies and practices to support beaver management and conservation throughout the state. So we're so grateful that the state is coming on board and not only that, they are coming on board with money to support this restoration. The most recent announcement of the two million in funding for drought, climate, and nature-based solution initiatives includes fifty-four million for the wetlands and meadow restoration nature-based solution initiative. And very much they are indicating they want to support the view restoration program of projects that might fall under that program purview. So we're really excited about this commitment from the state to fund these practices and really excited about the new format of their funding cycle being just ongoing and that we can get consultations before we actually submit a grant and that it's, um, yeah, it just seems like there's a lot of well, amazing new ways of going about doing this funding that the department is embracing. And so we applaud them for that and look forward to uh, supporting folks and going after this funding to do in particular beaver and process based restoration projects. So if you don't know what beaver and process race restoration is, there are great resources out there to uh, support you and, and getting in up to speed, highly recommend Utah State's low-tech process-based restoration and riverscapes design manual. This is a very uh, well-referenced and written tome. Uh, the Beaver Restoration Guidebook is also really well-written. It's getting an update this coming year, so that's exciting. And basically for us, when we're thinking about beaver restoration, there's things you can do initially to Make sure that you're doing all that you can to take care of the beaver that you have and where they are. And so coexistence is a big piece of that. As I was saying earlier, beaver, they modify habitats and they're trying to protect themselves and they work as a colony. And so unlike most rodents, beaver have, they keep their young for up to three years and work together. And it can be a colony of up to 10 individuals with, you know, with breeding care, leading and training all of their offspring in, in the arts of, of beaver habitat modification, which is no small feat. They, they can wreak a lot of change in an environment, much to many landowners and Department of Transportation and chagrin, and probably DWR as well. I, I'm sure they love to pl flood waterways. This is what they do. And we have solutions and we are here to help. And so one common complaint is culverts you know for them a culvert is just a hole in a dam that they can fill quite easily and 
make the water rise again. And this isn't always what we are intending with our culverts. And so we can outsmart them by putting a fence in front of that culvert and making it long enough so that the water just flows over with ease and the beaver, there's no, they have no impact if they try to block that fence. The water just keeps going. And so that's a great way uh, to protect our culverts and make sure they don't get blown out and that our expensive roads and infrastructure don't get damaged as well. This one on the right here is a, a rancher's pond that has, this is your spillway, and the beaver were blocking that. And so we were able to do something similar of, of putting a cage so they couldn't get out it and then having this pipe with a cage at it to bring the water through. So these work really well and they're super inexpensive and the the amount of maintenance is stage new is significant. And then we also want to be able to manage beaver flooding. So there are places where we have plenty of space for them to go wild and we want them to do that. But in urban and suburban areas in particular, we tend to want to have a little bit more say in that final height of those ponds that they're creating. And so that's where the flexible pond level comes in. This is a device we've been showing many departments of transportation, including Caltrans, we've worked with Sonoma Water Agency and uh, Eldorado Community Service District to show them how simply by putting a pipe through the dam, you can set the height of the pond behind it, and then the water just flows through. Again, this is just like a engineered, very simplistic uh, spillway that you're putting into the, the dam itself, and the beaver completely give up. They, they are triggered to build by the sound of water and they're listening for it on the uphills or the upstream side of the dam. So having the pipe go through and then just empty out on the downstream side doesn't bother them. They just tend to leave it alone. And then you cover the uh, inlet with a cage so that they can't hear or feel the flow in and they can't block it. And it's hard to block it anyway because this cage is big enough, but um, they wouldn't succeed. So again, super low cost. Uh, we ended up in downtown Sonoma helping the water agency put in four of these. And, um, you know, they need to be checked periodically. And if you get really high flows, sometimes they need to be adjusted or, you know, restored. But, <laughs> excuse me. Otherwise, again, very low cost and very high benefit. And one thing you do need to be really mindful of, though, especially in urban and suburban areas, is to have a lot of signage and education out because uh, well-meaning landowners often think that well, these are beaver traps <laughs> and that we're trying to harm the beaver when in fact we're trying to keep the beaver in place because the thing is is you don't want to lower the, the pond low enough that the beaver leave you want it low enough that you stop flooding in this case a roadway or a sidewalk but high enough that the beaver stay and you still get all the benefits of them sticking around so it's a win-win for everyone this is a device that we are piloting thanks to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's, uh, their refuge system. So this is a site, actually it was started at Sutter National Wildlife Refuge. They were the ones who invented it and we're really excited to be sharing information about this strategy for those of you who are working in the Valley and know landowners or you yourselves are managing these twin track Plant read weird. Testing on K3. You are going to want to know about these because basically our understanding is that the beaver are blocking these weirs daily and hundreds of thousands of personal hours are going into unblocking them and often causing back injury because it takes a lot of effort to pull out the sticks and the logs and everything that the beaver are pulling in. And lo and behold, this device, you can either manufacture yourself or have. In this case, we had Briggs manufacture it for us, and you just slide it into your weir. The pipe is perforated and has a cage at the end, so the beaver can't get in, nor can they block it. And it goes in, and voila, they just, they can't get at, they can no longer effectively block it, and they give up. And so this was a pilot that we installed at the Roosevelt Ranch Death Club. And the manager there has since said to us that it's a total game changer, 99.9% effective. And we're going to be putting them on all of their uh, 
queers that are having fever problems. And so we're just about finished making a little video about this in a brochure. And we'll be happy to get that word out to folks so that they can share this with the land managers they know that are suffering with them beaver blockage on um, the as well. And then trees, you know, certainly we have a lot of precious tree crops in California and then in urban and suburban areas. We have heritage trees on um, trees, ornamentals that folks don't want cut down. And so learning to protect them is, is really helpful and it can be as simple as just putting a sturdy welded wire. Chicken wire does not work. Definitely has to be something more sturdy because beaver will climb on it and collapse it. And so you want to make sure that it's, it's state and sturdy. You could also go so far as to get exterior latex paint or have a color match to your tree bark or arc some masonry or paint it on as they did in this area that had culturally significant uh, tree etchings up in uh, Bear Creek again. So we're really just trying to help here and make sure that folks are not getting out of control and getting into fights and providing folks with solutions as best we can. And speaking of solutions, back to the ranching community, we have been really grateful for the different ranchers that have come out in the last decade to really get behind beaver restoration. Again, there's a lot of historic practices that were adopted and passed down from family to family that are now being questioned. And we ended up helping the Marin Resource Conservation District and hosting a ranch rancher beaver panel. And these three folks showed up and got to talk about their different experiences of how the beaver were, in fact, increasing production for long or not causing a problem. And sure, there were times where beavers were just maybe in a ditch that they couldn't solve getting them out of and those songs were good for hats as the rancher liked to remind us um but in many cases there were so many more positive solutions that that folks could implement again low cost easily accessible easy to do and if you want to see there's a great video about the panel i've got a link right here and then also the um there's a, a documentary that was done about the ranchers in Nevada and the transformation that happened over 20 years there. So creating miracles in the desert is, is what you want to look for. You want to see that. Speaking of ranchers, this is a Placer Land Trust property that is in Lincoln, California, called Doty Ravine. And they lease it to Tracy Shore and her family's ranching business. And their cattle have been you know, doing all right, because they used to have this single threaded channel that they could at least get water out of, but it was pretty dry in the early years. And the land trust was really trying to restore this historic floodplain that used to come out to here, but since had been blocked because of levees and they were trying to do plantings, but there just wasn't enough water to restore it. And so they asked for help from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who obliged and said, but first thing we're going to ask you to do is to stop killing the beaver because they had basically adopted that uh, technique from the prior landowners and were trying to preserve their vegetation as well. And so they agreed. And not only did they stop killing the beaver, but they started reinforcing their dams, as you can see in this upper photo posts here. And to give them more space, they broke down the levees and started putting in some mock beaver dams or beaver dam analogs as they are called. But if you want to learn more about the criteria for process-based restoration, do check out uh, this amazing paper in bioscience that um, Ciotti et al, our good colleague, Damon Ciotti, uh, is the lead author on that. It talks all about this particular site. And if you haven't had a chance to ever see this site, it's a good field trip for sure, because Basically, in a matter of three years, they're able to increase the wetted area. It's actually now by 1,200%, and this was for under $58,000. And yes, they did have to move the cattle fencing progressively out, and the rancher's okay with that. The rancher says that they're able to stay there longer now because there's more forage. And this has now become a biodiversity hotspot in a place that was just 
really dry and dusty and fire prone in the foothills. So we all want to take this uh, example to heart. And so one other example I want to share is some work that we've been doing with the Mighty Summit Consortium, who are a group of uh, mountain mighty tribes that were given the valley that used to be called Humbug Valley. They Their uh, mighty name for it is Tasman Quayum. This is up in Plymouth County in the North Feather River watershed, basically just west of Lake Eleanor. This land was owned by pg e and as part of the settlement, they gave it back to the tribe, which is fantastic. And the tribe used to have beaver here and want beaver back. And in the meantime, we have been helping them figure out how to get them back by mimicking beaver and mm-hmm. making it ready for beaver, which it is very, very ready. And you can see by building these simple hand-placed structures, we're not using large machinery. Again, process-based restoration is really based on trying to use natural materials in from the site. Low fuel inputs do um, you know get the greatest benefit from the least amount of disturbance. And this, these techniques, they look really um, small and ineffectual. But in fact, this if this is what it looks like on the ground, these are all again hand placed, mimicking what beaver do. Then you look above and you see this is what it looked like before. And then this is what it looked like afterwards. So we went from a single channel. We were able to split that flow with 17 volunteers on an afternoon and increase the stream mile length by 358%. This is persisting. And this whole area now shows up in satellite photography as a major green hotspot. It's amazing. Similarly, this is uh, in the upper part of the valley. There was just these two stream channels and by doing a bunch of this work we were able to increase the stream miles by 324 percent and when i say we i'm talking about a whole bunch of partners swift water design was the main designer and implementer of this project but we worked in collaboration with us forest service and sierra fund and other partners in the special wildlife service and this is what it looks like now from above well this was actually the spring and so you can see what was once just a single channel now has become an anastomose braided channel and we are recharging this floodplain like you would not believe this is amazing and this is right after snow melts so we do have water melting and yet there are a lot of these areas that are spring fed and so this is going to persist throughout the summer and really help keep water on this landscape longer and make sure that our weather river has a big water spot. Oops, sorry about that. Um, okay, let me just find my cursor again. I'm still there. We go. So, no, we're gonna go to the next one. So there's so much more to be said, and obviously we don't have time in this short time that we have together at lunch, but I do want to point you to, we do have a uh, Be Grand California um, Stewardship Guidebook. If you haven't read the book, Eager, it is a fantastic read and a great audio book. Very humorous, but also well-researched and um, just a fantastic book. Highly recommend it. Last year, we did this Beaver Summit. Some of you were able to attend. Those of you that weren't, the recordings are all still up, and they're very short, uh, curated, 20-minute different talks, and you can pick and choose. So if you want to catch up, definitely check out this website and follow along. We are still trying to figure out where exactly beaver are in California, and we do not have a a good comprehensive database. My naturalist now has become the best uh, data set that we have that's most comprehensive. So for those of you who are in the field, we would really appreciate anyone adding observations, any, you know, fresh beaver sign, old beaver sign, beaver themselves. Um, and if you need to know more about that, feel free to reach out to me. And we have a new California process-based restoration network that we formed this last spring, and it is in full force now. We did a big training this fall up at Tasman Cuyon, which is what you see in the photo right there. And this is a great network to come and learn and share resources and just become part of this 
great group of regulators, agencies, and NGOs and practitioners and students and all kinds of tribes, folks that are really trying to do this work on scale across California. So with that, I'll say thanks so much. Really appreciate your time and your attention. And there is my email right there. If folks want to reach out to me directly, then I can also put it in the chat. So I will stop sharing now. And we can move into the discussion and any questions or however our esteemed facilitators want to facilitate this moment now. Thanks, Kay. That was uh, fantastic. Great pictures, great content. Um, uh, really thank you for sharing your work with us. Uh, this is kind of the time in our lunch bar where we invite people to turn on their cameras, unmute themselves, raise their hand to have a discussion and ask some questions. And there's some questions in the chat that I can help uh, uh, facilitate. But first off, I, I also have to say thank you for maybe the best trivia question for our holiday gatherings is what is the record size of a beaver? 120 pounds, but that is, that is fantastic. So I'm filing that one away. Um, I see Stephen with a hand up and camera on, so feel free to ask your question. Great, thanks. Thank you very much, Kate. This was really, really interesting. Um, I'm curious as to um, what happens when we place or have beavers in have levees and agriculture on the other sides of those levees. Um, that's kind of primarily the area that I manage, and we have some really interesting. Uh, creeks and and streams in the Coconut River, um, but it is you know primarily levied on either side with row crops or trees or vine um, on the other side. And was curious as to what you see the potential is for something in that application. Sure. Well, we have in both Sonoma, Sonoma and Napa counties, we have beaver up and down, you know, Sonoma Creek and also Napa River and a lot of the adjacent creeks. And they are coexisting in vineyards and row crops and all sorts of agricultural settings. And so it, it really, as always, it depends. You know, it depends on landowner tolerance. It depends on landowner capacity. In some cases, it can be as simple as exclusion. You know, a single hot wire can keep a beaver from going out into uh, ag lands. Um, but again, it depends, you know, what, what the situation is. Um, I, I would be happy to talk to you more, you know, if you have a particular site in mind. Um, but they often do coexist by, and there's a lot of places where the beaver are there and and the, the agriculturalists actually haven't learned that yet because they just have yet to stump out and chew down one of their premier Merlot vines like they love to do in Sonoma County. <laughs> but yes, the, it, it is possible. And I and you know one of the things we're really interested in is is just learning more about what the issues are because a lot of times the problem is more perceived than actual. And 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 then in some cases the actual problem has a solution that just hasn't been uh, implemented yet, and so that's where we're we just we're really open and it's a conversation. And there are places where it's like, nope, sorry, just isn't going to work. We can't find a solution, and that's you know now that we have the option with the department to start moving beaver, those beaver would be good candidates for for relocation. That would be the ideal of like, okay, we've exhausted all the options, we've resourced the the landowner with you know funds and technical assistance and and still this is not happening so but i would love to see you know in europe they they have beaver i mean their setbacks are even much smaller it's it's really quite fascinating to see you know what their riparian corridors look like in europe and they're they're learning how to coexist with the beaver there as well and so you know it's it's definitely a real issue and and something that we need to keep working on but there's a lot of folks interested in helping so love to continue the conversation thanks so much yeah that'd be great i think i'll definitely reach out awesome great uh, another question uh how are the best opportunities for process-based or beaver restoration identified? Is there mapping or guidance on, on trying to identify, you know, areas for potential restoration? 
That's a great question. And so we work with a lot of different folks in that space. Uh, there are several different tools. Uh, there is Utah State is really uh, interested in their Viva Restoration Assessment Tool, which they created for part of California. They didn't do it for the entire state. Uh, that is available online. And But what that is, is it's a dam building capacity model. And so it's really geared towards helping people choose places where they can get the most amount of dams per stream mile, which in some cases that is your restoration goal. But for process-based restoration, we're really looking at like, okay, what are your restoration goals? What are your source problems? Do you have a place that has space? Do you have a place that has materials? Uh, are there energy flows? You know, is there sediment you can be harnessing? Is there flow you can be harnessing? Can you be working with those processes to carry out the restoration? And well, do you, you know, can you do this over time? Can you do repeat? Um, applications, adaptive management, and whatnot, which is what Beaver do, and which is what we try to do with process-based restoration. And so another model that we look at, it, it's easiest to do these kind of uh, structures in lower gradient, floodplain, you know, adjacent areas where you have space. That's ideal, and you have materials. And so uh, one of the models that we've been using a lot up in the Sierra Nevada, which can be applied elsewhere, is it's called, uh, it's a, the U.S. Forest Service has been working on this. It's the Lost Meadow model, and it's really looking at areas where there is perennial flow and there is floodplain um, adjacent to the Rotarian Corridor, and, and those are areas that are really worth looking at. Uh, like, oh, maybe it's, you know, one of the things I love about Doty Ravine is is it has a very deeply incised single-threaded channel. It did. And now with this addition of more structure and wood and the allow, you know, allowing the beaver to come back in, that incised channel is slowly aggrading. But meanwhile, the beaver have moved up onto the floodplain and are fully flooding it above the incised channel. And so we don't actually need to have this perfectly connected floodplain yet. we That's where we can do structures and beaver to help make those connections. And and we do not have to like fill the incised channel. This incised channel of Doty is actually providing a lot of shaded habitat because of its, <laughs> its steep banks and the veg is hanging over it. And so right now it's working, it's great. And so that's the other fun thing that we're playing with um, because there's this tendency to want to just be like, quick, we've got to like flatten and fill and like get out all the bulldozers and make it a floodplain again. And then it's like, well, actually, we probably don't need to do that. We can do both and we can start working in the channel, you know, grading it and, and putting in these structures and, and letting Beaver do their work if we're so lucky to have Beaver there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. There's, Is there there's lots of different, yeah, lots of different tools. And, and yeah, I would definitely, uh, Come to one of our Cal PBR uh, meetings, and and um, we can tell you more. We're going to be doing one, uh, I think, in January, actually coming up. Yeah, is there a minimum area for for best opportunities? That's a really great question as well. So we've done. I mean, literally, uh, if you're doing, if you're trying, yeah, again, depending on what your restoration goals are, this can be done in in a tiny little system and it can be done massive on scale. So it's very scalable and that's what's great about it. So depending on where you are, what your you know situation is and what your opportunity is, then you can really just scale it. I mean, at Tasman Cuyam, this is a 2300 acre valley and we're getting to work with miles upstream and there's a lot of materials to, you know, we're helping Basically, we're doing forestry and, and meadow reclamation by cutting out all the encroaching conifers and then stuffing those. Where it, like fuels to um, flow is is what we're trying to do here and, and really having it be a multi-benefit project. And so, you know, depending on what your resources are. But again, a lot of this is so low cost. I think, you know, right now we're just we're doing a project in uh, West Marin in a tiny little half mile stretch of uh, sub-tributary of Stumble Creek that we're getting permitted. And so, you know, it's just what are your resources and 
I think if all folks were really just committed to trying to get these, you know, start small if you haven't done it and definitely work with professionals who know how to design these. Uh, and then once you get the hang of it, then you can start scaling up would be my recommendation. I have a couple questions in chat. Uh, what's the typical size of a den? Great question. So they often will build them under the root of a living tree to give structure to their roof. And they can do multiple chambers uh, if they have the space and the ability. Certainly the freestanding ones tend to have multiple chambers because they're building them themselves and they can. Um, but the, the bank burrows, you know, they have to hold at least a breeding pair, if not a breeding pair and four or five, you know, kits, yearlings and, and subadults. And so big enough for 10 is really helpful if, if the colony is successful. And again, uh, they will do multiple chambers if they can. Great. Um, another question from chat from uh, Melina. Do you think dams were native to Los Angeles County? I imagine that question is beavers are native to, to Los Angeles. So this is definitely one of the areas that is still under contention. And um, we have found both historic and uh, ethnographic evidence of beaver in Southern California. There's no reason to believe that they wouldn't be down there. Uh, I know a lot of the concern right now with beaver in Southern California is their interaction with endangered Southern steelhead. and a lot of the issues that steelhead are dealing with uh, didn't originate with the beaver, but in fact originated with humans who built dams on those systems. And now these regulated flows are, are really problematic for those fish. Um, so it's, we're, um, we feel really confident that they were, and you know, we have pictographs of beaver in, from Southern California, the Southern Sierra and the Cuyama Valley, you know, two native tribes have beaver pictographs. Um, there's some pretty compelling evidence, and I know there was a, a paper that came out, um, but it was not necessarily the best science that was done in the paper that was contesting the Southern California uh, extent of fever. So I'll keep it at that. Um, another question from the chat from Graham. Uh, given the original range of fever did not include uh, the most arid parts of California, does that suggest that climate change might strengthen the practical range within which beaver can flourish in California? It's a great question. And I think it's really going to just depend on flows. And, you know, with loss of snowpack, obviously some of our systems are becoming less reliable in, in terms of their flow, but we still have certain spring fed systems that are in arid regions that are doing fine. Uh, so once again, it'll depend. And as long as beaver have access to a perennial flow of some sort, it's it's been pretty amazing to see. I mean, obviously with climate change, we have other issues with you know winds, dehydrating winds, and and whatnot that are going to increase increasingly dry out our landscape. However, beaver have been successful in taking a fairly minor flow and creating, and if they have the right substrate and materials they can create a wetland that persists uh, and increases the wetted area significantly if as long as that flow is persistent. So uh, it'll depend, but I must say, I mean, rely on a rodent that works 24 seven for free to do its good work and maintains all of that wetland like you've never seen before, like seamlessly, like I would much rather bank on, on at least letting beaver try to do that than, than giving up on, on the beaver solution because it, you know, we have to pull out all the stops and really, you know, think creatively and, you know, beaver are not going to save us from climate change and they certainly can help us uh, mitigate the, the effects. Thank you. There's a couple more questions in chat, but I realize we're out of time, so we'll try to follow up with those. Uh, in our in our meeting notes, but uh, Kate, thank you again. Great presentation, photographs, and and uh, you know, great examples of of where beaver restoration is happening, and and how it support groundwater recharge. So, uh, if it'd be great if you all can give a virtual round of applause. I see some uh, some uh, hands uh, hands clapping virtually. So thank you.
And uh, happy holidays, everybody. We'll see you at the next uh, Lunch Mar in February. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you.